Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen. It's all sweet and nice in here. But sometimes I wonder, does the church act like Bridezilla? Because if I'm like you or you're like me, I don't like waiting. waiting I want it now and there's a lot of people like that Jesus is in a discourse here and we're in the time of the church here where we talk about the end of the year now once again we have to take and think biblically not according to the Julian calendar um, because the end of the uh, fiscal or uh, calendar year is different than the end of the church year and that comes at the end of this month so Jesus and our lessons are focusing on um, the end and all of these uh, parables all these sections are the same to get us ready for Christ coming again all of his farewells to the church in the many different ways he does it he mentions this, like right before he died in John 14, or at his ascension in Acts chapter 1, or even at the end of the scriptures in Revelation 22, Jesus is talking about coming back. And so how do we get ready when he shows up? That's what this parable is about. And there are things for us to consider because it's what? Everlasting concern to every person. First of all, we note that Jesus is talking about the kingdom of heaven, the state of the things under the gospel, the external kingdom of Christ, the administration of it, the success of it, that it will be. Some of his parables have told us what it will be like now in the present reception of it. And some parables tell us what it's going to be like and what it shall be when the mystery of God is finished and the kingdom is delivered to the Father. But we have to do a little background. We've got to know something about this wedding feast. And it was a custom among the Jews on that occasion that when the bride would, would come, uh, attended by his friends, and usually late at night, sounds like an arranged marriage to me, um, he would come to the house of the bride, and she expected him. She was waiting with her bridesmaids, who upon given the notice of the bridegroom coming, that they would go out with lamps in their hands, kind of like luminaries, you know, at Christmas on your sidewalk, uh, something, uh, or, or bouquets on the pews. We even roll out a, a white uh, sheet for the bride to walk up on, you know, if we do the wedding in church. We're doing this, they're doing it. It's all the same for that, that heightenedness, uh, specialness of the ceremony of how special this is, that the coming together of the bride and groom, we do it in a very formal way to celebrate what this event is. And why would there be 10? What is the significance of that number? Well, the Jews couldn't have synagogue in a town unless there were 10 Jews there. Those that were circumcised kept the Passover 
um, you know, 10 people had to be present. For instance, uh, Boaz, when he married Ruth, had 10 witnesses, which you can find in Ruth chapter 4. So this is a parable that Jesus is telling, and he's using familiar symbols from uh, their faith to help them understand. But remember, it's a parable, which is a story with a point, a spiritual point on it. So let's find out what those points are. There's at least four. There might be more. Jesus is the groom. Was there any doubt? Okay, Psalm 45, the Song of Solomon, so many times in the New Testament, Jesus is the groom, and he loves his bride, the church. And that's us, which really trips us up, males, you know, we have trouble with being a bride. Um, but that's a mental thing, we'll get over it, so the longer we think about it. But you have to understand, Jesus can't wait to marry us. He can't wait for that last day when he comes back to gather his church. Okay, so Jesus is the groom. We are the virgins. Okay, we got troubles with that again. All right. (laughs) But those that follow the lamb, it says in Revelation chapter 14, verse 4, those that follow the lamb are the virgins. It's also in Psalm 45 and in Isaiah 54. And beauty and purity are the characteristics of those who follow the lamb, the virgins, if you will. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we're the ones that are presented to Christ. Okay, so Jesus is the groom, we're the virgins, and our job is to be ready to meet the bridegroom. Okay, we get that part. While we await his arrival, whenever that's going to be, what do we do? We speak as to honor his name. We watch our language to make sure what we say is good for others to hear. We praise, honor, listen to him what he has said and we listen to the one who sent him because of his love for us what is that all together but worship and that's what we're doing and we long for his coming oh really you know all right it's already you know goodness and it's 2017 man Do we long for his coming anymore? Do we long for his coming like kids waiting on a birthday party? Ooh, man, I can't. Gonna get cake. Ah. (laughs) Or you to go trick-or-treating, you know. Is it 7 o'clock yet? Is it? How do I look? Or fireworks on the 4th of July. Isn't it dark enough? Come on. Or if you're dating, you call from somebody you just gave your number to. Remember those days. Our Savior's return. Do we long for it like that? It's where all the lines of our faith intersect. He's the center of everything. Jesus is the groom. The virgins are us. Our job is to be ready. What's this light that we have? Why is he talking about light? And why can't we borrow somebody else's oil? That would be nice, wouldn't it? By the way, in Hebrew, Greek, and English translations, the word nice does not appear in your Bible. So get that thought out of your head. You have to speak the truth in love, but you have to speak the truth in love. Isn't that nice? Now, consider this light thing, this number four. You are the light of the world. Jesus himself said that. We are the children of light. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. We're children. The gospel is the light of the world. You can't be light without the Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit shining through you. You can't be light. 
You don't have the oil in you if you don't have the Holy Spirit without him shining through you. And we see that by how you live your life, by how you talk, by how you care for others, by how you speak at a voters meeting, how you, we're having one today, I thought I'd throw that in, you know, those kind of things. We see that by how people live their life, about how they care for others, and nobody can do that for you. That's why you can't borrow oil. It has to be your oil. It has to be your light. It has to be your lifestyle. It has to be your words. It has to be the way you spend money and time and care for other people. But even more, who's the light for? I mean, you know, we can look at what is light. Who's it for? It's not just for us. Yes, it is for us, but it's not just for us. Today's a bad day to talk about sunlight. Okay, welcome to Cleveland, Ohio, where I was raised. 68% of the time, which means 246 days, it looks like this. 246 out of 365. My brother calls it living under the elephant. You look up and it's gray. And things are happening. <laughs> but if you want to talk about sunlight on another day, <laughs> God intended light, like the sun, for everybody. He intended it for the good, just and the unjust. He intended it for the good, for the bad, for all people. He sends his blessing of light and our light is for us yes but even more for others the light of the world jesus christ is for all people and it is that light that oil that is in us that shows to others philippians uh, paul writes in chapter 2 that we are to shine as lights Hide it under a bushel? No, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine all the time. See, our problem in this text, our problem in our lives, is that some days we're not doing today what is needed to be ready for tomorrow. We're doing today what we think is important for us and not including what Jesus thinks is important and that's our sin let me use an illustration of momentary joy and I hope I offend some young people because I used to play video games okay I started with Pac-Man I'm that old never could understand the point got pretty good at it so what and what do you win you know I just, do you change the world do you know there's a new psychological term called constant partial attention parents know what that means when they think of their kids because what they're on their phones or they're on their game boys or they still make those and <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of those toy things, and, and they're, you know, first-person shooter, and they're, you know, it, it, even in teams. I got a grandson that talks, you know, over his computer with other guys on the team and say, hey, you left me behind, wait a minute, you know, and they're, they're playing team games. What are they winning? What are they changing? What are they doing that matters? Nothing. They're wasting time. Now, is it okay to have fun? Sure. Is it okay to play video games? Maybe. <laughs> but to excess? You see, all of a sudden, what are you doing? There's a commercial on television where there's two girls and the dad, all three are sitting on a sofa, and the two girls are texting each other, and he finally realizes it. They're all sitting on the sofa. We have used technology to be more in touch and less in touch at the same time and Satan works in that 
because the oil, the light, does not shine. God pours in the oil of grace, but do we receive it? We come to church, but we don't take church home. I know of families, not in this congregation, but in my last congregation, they would be fighting on Saturday night, they'd be fight, still continuing to fight on Sunday morning, and they'd be arguing in the car, they'd come into church and say, hi, pastor, how you doing, everything's great, and go home mad. Now that's not applying faith to themselves. That's not building up one another's character. That's not truth applied to self. Maybe I've got something that I'm doing that's wrong. Maybe I'm not listening. Maybe I'm not caring. The daily routine is not adjusted. And on and on and on it goes, and we don't use the oil that God continues to pour out. Remember, this is a parable that Jesus is telling. It's a parable. It's a story with a spiritual point. And the wise people, the companions of the groom, take what happens here into daily life, and they can shine everywhere. They have a rich supply of the Lord's light and his love that they can share with others. And we see that in their eyes. We see that in their character. We see how they love their family, how they love and care for others, how they love the Lord's work. If your heart is the lamp, and it is, and if God's grace is the oil, then you will shine every day, no matter how long it takes for him to come back. And what a great day that will be. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus until life everlasting. Amen.